for today. Uh, unfortunately, I have a tendency to do that. And it said that um, I should be very careful because I'm going to make someone mad uh, by what, something I say. Now, I generally do that a lot whenever I do a presentation. So um, before I get started, I want to apologize ahead of time uh, because I'm sure I will make somebody mad. Um, and second of all, to, to, to actually scope this, keep in mind that we're going to talk about not every technology out there that's having an impact on, on rec electronic records management, and we're not going to talk about the entire market, but we're going to try to scope some of that down. And we're also not going to be talking about some of the different new practices, um, although information governance to me is not new, but it's become something that people have uh, spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, so we're not talking as much about practice as much as we are some of the practices that need to take place before you implement any technologies. Now, just to give you a um, heads up on what we're going to really try to talk about, the cloud, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. I think some of the presentations that were done earlier by Bud Potter Roth and, and the, the previous one to mine by Lawrence Hart give you a lot of information that you need from that perspective. But we're just going to give a little bit of a perspective on what is going on out there from a records management standpoint. Analytics, big data analytics being a part of that whole big data area. Social media, <laughs> the pain point in some cases of records management. Uh, distributed repositories. I mean, how many of you have situations where you have records now located, or records repositories, digital repositories, now located in multiple different repositories throughout your organizations? Quite a few, OK? And that presents a challenge. And there are some different schools of thought from both an operational and a technology standpoint that have come up. And we'll talk about some of the technologies that support that. Um, including managing in place in the federated search, dare we say even managing records feder on a federated basis. And then, of course, migration. Um, migration utilities and the operational necessities. I've been talking to and have dealt with many companies right now that are going through the second, third, sometimes the fourth generation of an ECM system and need to have a, a way of migrating that records information, the digital records, from one system to the next. And that's becoming quite a challenge. So let us move forward. What do you need to consider? I'm not going to go through this list other than to say that where it is stored, the geographic challenge that a lot of organizations are having, even if you're not a European company, but you are a global company, this is a challenge for you. And it's called data sovereignty. And so something to consider and always be aware of when you're using the cloud in your, if you're a global organization. And all these other things have actually been discussed and, and are presented in other presentations. So again, these are just things you should think about and ask a cloud provider and ask yourself, do I need to worry about these kinds of things? And of course, the bottom line is, how much will this cost? Um, going to the cloud, as we all know, is not just about cost but cost does have a significant impact on the decision to go to the cloud. And that's for all implementations, but records is no exception. One of the things that did come up a few months ago, I was um, talking to a group of capture vendors about um, the impact that the cloud has on the capture process, and especially as it pertains to records. Um, because you're going to a different environment in some cases. And so in some areas, some people feel they need better encryption of, of the record as it is being scanned or, or if it's being captured automatically, not necessarily an image, but a, um, a digital record that's all, you know, born digital. Uh, consolidated categorization. You know, how do we make this simpler? Automated categorization. Uh, re redefining the indices. 
as you're moving along? Is there a better way to organize the information before you go up to the cloud? Do that before. You know, if you have a bad process and put it in a bad situation, you know, on your internal system, don't think that just putting it on the cloud will make it any better, probably make it a lot worse. Uh, maintaining authenticity across the process, that chain of custody issue. Making sure that the record and the metadata that is captured or being migrated from your present record system and going to the cloud is maintained. And then, of course, the standard metadata fields and elements. And this is all part of the capture process. Whether it's a new capture process or an old one, these are things that need to be you need to be concerned about um, either way. The more challenging aspect, and this again has been brought up in, in a lot of or, uh, previous presentations, is how do you manage records that are born on or stored on the cloud? A lot of people don't realize they're actually creating records, official records, by putting them on box.net or Dropbox. And this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but these are just examples. And this is not meant to be a slam on any one of these particular um, vendors. I use Box, Dropbox, Office. I use quite a few of these things. Um, and they're all very good. But I also am very careful about what I put up there. Don't like putting client records up there because I don't know what's going on with them and I don't want to sh necessarily share them with anybody. Um, so making sure that if you are, if your organization is doing this and they are, they could tell you they're not, but they are, having an approach to managing these kinds of things is very important. So start talking to those vendors. Because vendors don't make changes to their practices unless they know there's a user base out there that's interested in making changes to those practices. And if you feel that you have records being created and or stored in these environments and you need to have some sort of records management function, the only way that's going to happen is if you talk to the vendors and say, I really need this and I'm willing to pay for it. Um, and, and that might get things going. But it's still a challenge. There are some tools out there. There are some, um, it is happening at this point. But uh, I wouldn't, I'll be honest, I don't think some of them are really all that ready for prime time, um, at least for things like Dropbox. I think there's some uh, activity on the Google level because it is becoming much more ubiquitous and people are actually making decisions to use Google Docs and Google Apps on an enterprise-wide basis. And once that happens, then you start seeing more tools. And so we are seeing more tools supporting those different environments. Um, documents generated, these are the problems that you can have. Um, and again, these have been brought up in other um, presentation, so I don't want to take up too much time talking about each one of them. I'm sure you can read those. And if you have any uh, questions about that, please you know, just raise your hand later, and we'll try to define what those really mean. But I think they're pretty straightforward. Is it hype? Is records management on the cloud hype? No. It's happening. Um, but it definitely needs to be managed. We're starting to see things like RecMan for Google Mail, and we're also seeing other vendors, again, offering uh, support for Google. Um, I myself am working and work for IQ Business Group, and we are doing work with open text on the cloud, um, actually archiving many emails um, and classifying them and auto-categorizing them. Um, to manage his records, so that's part of what we're doing there. Uh, IBM FileNet works with Viewpoint, and again, these are cloud implementations. This is not a comprehensive list, but just an example of the fact that these things are happening. And so th these are alternatives you should think about, but think about the fact that you want to be able to understand the scale. How many records are you going to put up there? How much, what kind of software support you're going to need? You know, will the software itself be functional for you? And that's one of the reasons why you should always look at records manage, electronic records management software in, on the cloud the same way you would for your own implementation from that standpoint, functionally speaking. Moving on to analytics and predictive coding, 
It's the key to managing large volumes of electronic records. We've talked, there have been, again, presenters earlier today and in the past few days that have talked about analytics and the use of those kinds of tools because the volume is impossible to manage in the typical ways that we've done in the past to do with declare a record, declare a record. Try that for millions of records. That's not reasonable. That's not tenable. So the, the need to use analytics and auto categorization and other types of tools is not just pie in the sky, it's reality. It's something that you have to really consider. Auto classification is the ability to have the system put and categorize the records in the places that they should be in. And the same thing in terms of auto case, uh, blah, 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 excuse me, early case assessment is part of the function of e-discovery. And again, using different al analytic tools, we're starting to see more courts say, use whatever tools you like, just as long as you've made a reasonable effort to provide the right information as part of this discovery process. Now, the US is the most litigious country in the world, which is why discovery is such a big issue. It's not as big an issue in, in many other countries, but it is a big issue here. And so, again, look at the analytics out there, look at early case assessment for managing those, the, that part of the process. And of course, sampling and observation, making sure that you, you actually can audit and make sure that the volume of information you have is, has the integrity that you think it has. And you may have to do sampling to be able to do that. So just to focus on auto classification for a minute, it is the ability of the system to automatically add metadata to the record and move it to the category, in case those of you who don't understand that. Um, analytics are improving. If you asked me last year or the year before if I thought auto categorization was something you should think about, I would have told you, yes, you should think about it, but you should think about it as a second phase of your project. Make sure that you understand where your categories should be before you start implementing auto categorization. And in many ways, I still believe that. I still think you obviously need to know where everything should go before you start allowing a system to put things where it thinks it should go. Because I've seen too many situations where some organizations have used this as a first phase priority and they find somewhat inconsistent results. Uh, things aren't quite where they thought they should be. And when it comes to records, consistency is extremely important. It may not make as much of a difference for your other types of documents, but official records should always go in the same place that they're supposed to go, or the right place. Some assembly is required. It's like anything else. These are learning systems in many cases. They don't know, just like the people in your organization, unless you tell them where to put it, they're not going to know where to put it. Well, the same thing goes for auto classification engines or any type of analytics. In that case, you really need to train the system. Give it good exemplars. Make sure that the examples, like any type of product going into production system, you want to make sure that your test bed, the, the, the documents, or any kind of examples that you're using to test your application represent all the different variations that you're going to have in that system. The same thing goes for your records and the examples that you use to feed into your classification engine. Make sure you have enough volume and diversity in those examples to make the system understand and learn things correctly. That makes all the difference. Social media, well, can you support, it's a big problem for many organizations to deal with the different types of information that you're going to find on social media sites, such as Twitter and, and, and um, Facebook and so on including blogs and wikis and, so, and that kind of thing. But you have to plan for discovery. It's not a matter of if these things will become evidence. They are already becoming evidence in some cases. Now, you could take the brute force method of taking snapshots of posts on Facebook and Twitter and that kind of thing. But that will take up a lot of time and 
not be productive. There are new tools out there. Some of the vendors that sell electronic records management systems know this is a challenge and have come up with some ways of capturing some of that. The other thing is to provide this collaborative environment internally. If a lot of these types of things are internal type processes, is to make sure that you're providing the tools and the, and the capabilities internally with those so you can capture the records. And these are just, like I said, mostly brute force ways of dealing um, with things. But also a reminder, understand that Facebook posts can be deleted by you and you think, oh, I deleted it. It didn't happen. It did. It's there. It's evidence. And then establish governance. Tell people what they should be doing. You know, establish guidance. I know it's difficult in many organizations. You can tell people all the all the time what they should do. What I find is consequences matter. If people don't understand there's a consequence, nothing will happen. If people understand there's a consequence to not following um, the guidance, maybe you'll see some change. Either way, this is t an area that I think is still on the fringe when it comes to what ERM vendors are offering. Adding support for social networking features, they're there. How fast that's happening, I'd say, is not as fast as the, the, use of those, <laughs> the use of social media is happening. So it's still a challenge. But either way, you should look at your ERM software. And if you haven't upgraded lately, if you're using an ECM suite of any type, you really should look at the new features and functions that are out there and ask your ERM vendor if they're offering social media access or at least records access and making sure that they're capturing those types of communications. Because some of them have changed in that regard. Where are they located? We talked, to, I mentioned earlier, all these distributed systems um, or records repositories. These happen because of mergers and acquisitions. There's the SharePoint explosion. Um, pilot farms, I call these pilot farms. You know, you start a pilot, it becomes a production system, then some other department starts a pilot. It's like old McDonald's farm. Here a pilot, there a pilot, everywhere a pilot, E-I-E-I-O. Um, you end up with all these different systems out there and they are real records repositories and you have to have a way of managing those. Um, they are a fact of life for many of you, I'm sure, and other organizations as well. So what do you do? Well, you have two, uh, you have several different uh, alternatives. One allows the organizations to enforce records retention rules across multiple disparate repositories. That, one approach to that is called managing in place. Being able to keep the repositories you have, making sure that some central software product can then access those repositories and manage those repositories, making sure that the, you know, the records there are declared or managed and retained uh, in an organized way. The other is just to allow people to find those records, not necessarily managing them, because they still may be managed by their own um, applications that they may be running, as different as they may be, but to allow for the search capabilities. And those are two very different things, very different things. And depending on the needs within your organization, when someone says they support federated records management, you have to ask, what do you mean by that? Is that a search capability or is that a real management capability? And you know, decide for your own organization or decide within your organization what it is you really need and how you want to proceed. A lot of it depends on the culture of the organization. Telling people to move from systems that they're very comfortable with is, as we all know, a very painful exercise. And it has less to do with the technology and more to do with the people that you're using or dealing with. The other side of the coin is what I call migration. I've also seen and, and observed lately a lot of organizations taking the tack that, no, we're not going to have multiple repositories, we're not going to have multiple vendors, we're going to standardize on one vendor. That takes courage, but the, again, they're dealing with second and third generation systems, here's an opportunity to move to the next generation but move to one vendor. The recognition, the lack of information governance then has to be addressed because then 
there has to be an organized way to do the migration and links to all these other legacy applications that may have already been linked to these older ERM systems have to be resolved. What are the tools that are out there for that? There's Open Text has just introduced InfoFusion, and then of course there's a lot of bulk import utilities out there. So look at your, uh, your um, alternatives, but keep in mind that it's not the technology that tends to be the problem, it's that governance process to migrate all these systems into one standard product that tends to be the challenge. Market is still very confusing. Um, this is not a comprehensive list, and of course it's a really good eye chart. Um, it's meant to help to break out the market for those people that are looking for different types of tools. Um, useful tools as well that are not necessarily records management tools per se, in that they don't have the decla declarative and functional uh, capabilities necessarily of of records management is, um, one example is getting rid of rot, as we know. The stuff that you want to do, especially if you're going to migrate, it's good to ha get rid of all the stuff that you don't need to migrate first. And uh, just an example of one tool there is active navigation. They do more than that. They have some other analytical tools, but this is one of the things that they can do. And of course, there's e-discovery early case assessment tools, such as Xtero and, and RicoMind. These are adjuncts to what you do, and there's plenty more. Um, so keep those in mind. These are usually, you know, if you look at ERM software, in many cases you're going to have to look at other tools to help boost the functionality of that software. I'm not going to describe ECM suites and all this other stuff, but these are the general um, understanding of what ECM suites are. Same thing with Pure Play, obviously. Pure Play are those records management vendors that focus just on records management. Platform. Microsoft. It's a platform. Does it have a full-fledged ERM product? It has an ERM functionality. M but most people that I know don't consider it a full-fledged ERM platform. But that's created a market opportunity for several different vendors out there to build a full-fledged ERM platform on a Microsoft, blah, blah, a Microsoft architecture. Microsoft SharePoint architecture. And of course, just like anything else, you have to make sure that that platform is as up to date as your SharePoint environment. Uh, vertical and business applications, they could be standalone RM products, but the idea is they, they tend to focus on one vertical or one type of application. And then, of course, paper. Still out there, hasn't gone away. Now, most good and Comprehensive electronic records management products can handle both digital and paper. But there are some that don't, and, and so paper and analog isn't going away anytime soon, especially if you have large preservation requirements for archiving paper that's been around. So keep that in mind, that they're out there. And unfortunately, as we mentioned earlier, not all of these things are automated yet. Things like information governance, retention schedules are something you still have to manually do. There are vendors out there that are trying to address some of the information governance challenges out there, like RSD with their glass product. Um, and those are things that you really should think about because it helps to help you manage the, um, the organization of the information that you have. So I've sped through that. It's hard to go through a whole market thing without, you know, usually this takes me a couple of hours. So uh, with that, I'll take questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Um, well, hey, there we go. There's a question. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry you didn't spend a lot of time on your slide with the different vendors and the different players and where you slotted them in. But I was wondering, I was wondering if there's a, um, a document management system or an enterprise records management system that's, that's, uh, that hits a sweet spot where it's not too expensive to get into and start, that can grow with you, it's cloud-based, um, but that can, that can also support all your governance needs. Well, most records management vendors, um, they tend to be the, in the ECM suites area, will say they're cloud-ready and they have an approach to that. Um, and, and you know, depending on pricing, I can't talk about quite honestly um, because everything is negotiable. 
okay, depending on who you're talking to. Um, I think before you look at price, you should look at whether or not they're scalable in the environment that you start in so that you're not just scaling on, on function, but you're also scaling on price. So you know going in in many cases, whether you're using the cloud or you're using um, a, a standalone system or an integrated system, that the less number of licenses you, you have, the, le the more you're going to pay per, per user. And that's not unusual. Um, but if there's an understanding that it's going to grow, that's a negotiating point. So keep that in mind. You're not just scaling function, you're scaling um, price that the vendor has had a history of being able to do both. And I look at history more than anything else for that. And I don't like to just say any particular vendor because number one, like I said, price is negotiable. So look at their functions first and then start talking money. And the business models of software licensing change like daily depending on where they stand. Hi, I actually have a comment and then a question. So first, thank you very much. You're um, I, I've mentioned, so I hope I'm not repeating myself too much, but in a few other sessions that, and I'm sure you'll agree that when people are developing business requirements for their ERMS, their enterprise records management system, that some of the standards out there like MoREC and DOD, et cetera, form very good basis, which of course they need to customize to them, for themselves, Definitely. but helpful. That's my comment. My question is, could you please uh, speak a little more about auto classification and changes that you've seen in the technology within the last year or two? Yeah, well, auto classification, the technology, and I don't want to get into, I, I personally can't get into all the different types of learning technologies that are being used. There's a variety of, every vendor out there has a different sort of technique. Some of them are based and built on you know, the same types of techniques. But the idea is they are getting better because they're getting more precise. And they, in many cases, they don't need as many samples as they used to need before. So before you'd have to have, let's say, hundreds of thousands of documents in a base to establish where things need to be uh, categorized. Now, maybe just hundreds. And so it, the, the, it's, they're getting better at learning with a smaller test base. And, that, and the precision is getting better. So that, but you know, as a records manager, you don't want 80% precision in many cases because that's not exactly where things are. And most records managers that I know want at least 90 to 92 and up. Um, so that's, that's really very important, and we're starting to see that much sooner. And that's where the improvements are coming in. Uh, just one thing that that uh, uh, standards um, compliance raises is what is your view on how to raise an RFP? Um, yeah. Well, I've always had the view that, you, first of all, records management is a process. To me, managing records is all about business process. Understand the process that you're trying to support. You know, the technology, important, but to pick the right technology, you really need to understand the process that you're supporting from a business standpoint. So when you raise an RFP, you should be explaining what you're trying to do as a business first. What architectures you have first. What kinds of people you have first, and then get into your functional requirements and those kinds of things. So that's really been my, my experience and I think you get a better um, response, a more intelligent response when you do that. Absolutely agree there. Uh, questions from, yep, one over there. Getting further and further back in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Um, I'm oh, particularly you. interested in your assessment of uh, how the open source solutions uh, are looking I in think this market. Uh, quite honestly, uh, there's a few. Uh, there's not a lot, but I think they're holding up well in the market um, in, in terms of 
having the features and functions. The ones that I know of have not held up as well in the managing the paper side of the market. But in terms of digital, um, um, digital records, they, they hold up functionally uh, well in that market. The challenge, of course, is, is support and, and making sure that things can be customized the way you want them to. That then says you really need a good systems integrator to help you do that. And that, you know, that's, in a, that's, that's a, you know, both a financial and, and implementation decision. But you'd have to make that decision anyway, no matter which vendor you use. So um, I don't distinguish them that differently than all the other vendors. They compete just as well as all the other vendors in the ECM suites area, from what I can see. One insight I've heard about that recently is that if, if you feel that a, an open source product in the cloud could by its nature be less secure uh, because the source is available, uh, it turns out actually it's more secure because some of the big security agencies will go down that route because they can analyze how uh, vulnerable the open source product is and point out those vulnerabilities to the open source provider who can then stop them up. So in some ways, it's counterintuitive. I will take one well, more question. Oh, I was going to say, I hope I didn't make anybody mad today. But <laughs> one more question.